right, thank you again for being here today. Uh, don't you love Father's Day? It's so, I love Father's Day so much that even my dad snuck a drawing inside of my binder. Brandon, you are amazing. That is true Father's Day stuff. I'm excited for today. I love today. Um, I've only spoken probably one or two Father's Day in my ministry preaching career, and I, I just... I'm so burdened and blessed by this day. And again, my, my brother Cody asked me, you doing good? You, you, anything I could pray for? I felt the overwhelming burden for dads this morning. And um, man, I love you. I care for you. Those watching online or watching later, I know this is that one day where Mother's Day is always packed for church. Father's Day is one of those days where it's like, I'm sleeping in, you know, watching golf. But I want to say for those that are here and those that watch later, the Lord loves you. And I just felt a couple things this morning, that God wanted to break this overwhelming sense of shame for dads that have felt like they've missed it or dropped the ball. Your father in heaven loves you and he's for you, not against you. And today I want you to know, today will not be a day of shame. I, I feel like as I was praying, there's a lot of dads that will come in or listen later where you're listening out of obligation. Today is not the day to tell you what you should be doing. It's a day to affirm who you are and who God's called you to be and living those things out. So I'll talk about a few things that will be challenges today. I wanna encourage your spirit. I want you to feel empowered to live out that call. And then uh, today I, I'm gonna be honored and blessed. I'm gonna interview my dad at the end of the service which I, I just want to be a beautiful thing and, and a sign to us. My father did not grow up in a Christian family. He was a first-generation believer, and uh, he's now seen the fruit of that in his son's lives and, and those he's impacted along the way. So I'm excited for today. But as I was prepping, I really wanted to dive in and say, okay, Lord, what was the Jewish understanding of fatherhood? And as I was studying, I came across this proverb that I could not fit in my message because it would derail it too much. But I, as I wrote this down, I, I wanted to share this to my brother, Sean. This is a, a proverb I believe you will now remember and never forget. Uh, this comes from the book of Sirach. Now, Sirach is an ecclesiastical book uh, written between 100 and 200 B.C. by the Jews. It would hold this as a book of wisdom. This is what Sirach 42 verse 9 says. A daughter is a secret anxiety to her father. <laughs> and worry over her robs him of sleep. When she is young, for fear she may not marry, or if married, fear she may not be disliked. I love that. Sean, I thought of you, buddy. All those sleepless nights. Any dads of daughters out there with me? Come on. Sleepless nights. I love that. There's no way to work that in a message, but that is very true. This is very true. Daughter, dad of two daughters here. Uh, this is our anchor verse for today. We're in a series called Spirit Led. And my goal is that you would live out this spirit-led life as a father. So today, our message is called Patterns of Powerful Fathers. That's what we're going to preach on today. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 says this. For though you might have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Indeed, in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Let's pray this morning. Jesus, we again thank you for your presence. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. You're already here. You've already been present and active. You're here to heal. I, I just see the Lord repairing the wound of the soul today, the wound of the heart. Lord, we know today can be a hard day for some, where it's your first Father's Day without your father. Maybe this day is, is a remembrance of a dad that was not there. Lord, we declare the love of our heavenly Father who is eternal to be here now and fill every vacuum and heal every heart. Just even pray for the single moms right now. Those that are out there where the dads have not been present, Jesus, we thank you that you fill the gap of absent fathers. You not only fill it, you go above and beyond and you heal it. And Lord, I just pray today for the natural dads in this house, those that are spiritual fathers as well. The spirit of boldness and courage would rest upon them. I just want all men to stand up right now in this auditorium. Just stand to your feet. If you're online watching, stand up in your living room. God's with you. Extend your hands towards them right now. Holy Spirit, we say empower these men in Jesus' name. 
Raise them up. Give them voices of wisdom, authority, understanding. That they would walk in the call they're called to walk in. God, we pray that you'd break off all addiction in Jesus' name. Things that would be binding them or discouraging them. Every generational curse would be bound in Jesus' name. We declare freedom. Freedom. Just say freedom in Jesus' name. Freedom in Jesus' name. That God, you would give them encouragement in this moment to know the men they are called to walk as and live out. God, bring provision. Bring direction. Let them know where you're leading them in this next season. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, turn to them next. You said, we love you. We love you, dads. Well, I grew up in an era of incredible toys. The 80s and 90s. Incredible toys. We had the first, the real generation of G.I. Joes. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Transformers. See, our shooters were not games like Fortnite. We had Duck Hunt, church. And you took that electric light gun and you would shoot it at your TV screen. And that little dog would pop up with your spoils of war. That was my era. And let's not forget the Easy Bake Oven. <laughs> Ladies, I got you. Don't worry, I had one too. We loved them. Those brownies were weird, but they were good. They were good. 80s and 90s toys, superior. But we all had a neighbor that had a toy that we didn't, that we coveted. Am I right? And they often weren't the expensive ones. They were the ones that were hard to find. And mine was an electric light spinning top. This is what it looked like. I actually found the photo. And they came out, probably late 80s. I was seven years old. And my friend, my neighbor, his name was Chucky. In the 80s, I kid you not. And he lived out that personality. Chucky was the one kid. My parents were like, do not hang out with Chucky. And of course, you hang out with Chucky every day. Ha, ha, ha. You know, one of those kinds of kids. So Chucky had this electric light spinning top, and he was the best in the neighborhood. This was hard. This isn't one of those automated ones with a pullback retractable string. You had to manually wind it. So all the neighbors got it, and Chucky was the best. And so I set my eyes on finding this electric light spinning top. So I saved my allowance and looked everywhere and couldn't find it until one magic Saturday at Denio's Farmer's Market and Auction. <laughs> What's new at Denio's? Oh, the spinning top was at Denio's. I got my, got my spinning top, came home. My dad had to go to work in the afternoon. As I have this spinning top, I load it with the batteries, and I'm determined to be the best top spinner in my neighborhood. Elk Grove, California. I was ready to be the top spinning champion. So I wound it up manually, threw it on the ground, and I expected it to spin, and it just hit the ground and fell. It's okay, it's first try. Wrap it up again, spin it, throw it on the ground, it falls. Three times, four times, five times. And the anger and frustration starts to mount up. I'm so mad at this point. Tenth time, go throw it on the ground. And my mom could sense, I'm in the living room, she could sense that the anger was coming. And they knew that if they heard this phrase, you had to hold back things that could get broken. And I, I'm there and I throw it on the ground. I go, I hate this. My mom goes, what's wrong? I'm like this stupid spinning top. I can't spin the top. And she's like, Brandon, practice makes progress. You'll do fine. Just keep practicing. I'm just, throwing it on the ground. I'm just getting mad now. I'm just throwing it on the ground and it, it's getting nicked up. And I'm, I'm so mad. And I'm, I'm just going to warn you. This, this is going to be an abrupt change. I just want to warn you. As I'm there spinning this top, I hear this inner voice say, you should probably kill yourself. And I hear this say, kill yourself, and I get this picture of me slitting my wrists. I'm not exaggerating. Seven years old. The pit of hell is in that living room. And this lie gets lodged in. And my mom can sense that I'm in distress, and I just yell, I should probably just kill myself. My mom says, what did you say? It's like, I'm just so mad. I, life isn't worth living anymore. And, and again, I had a household that understood the spiritual, right? She said, that is a lie from the pit of hell. We are going to talk to your father when we get home, right? <laughs> that was one of those moments. She grabs me, and, you know, she, she's just trying to hold back the emotion of this. So I go to my room. I'm like, oh, man, I blew it big time. Dad gets home. Son, 
heard you said something pretty serious. Yeah, Dad. What'd you say? I said, I should probably just kill myself. Son, you know where that lie came from? Yeah, it came from the devil. That is a lie, son. And that spinning top does not determine your value. It does not determine your worth. Come out to the garage. And man, when you went out to the garage, that was a terrifying walk. You don't know what's going to happen in that garage. Get in the garage. My dad opens up the garage door. He says, where's the top? I pull out the top. He says, see that hammer over there? I want you to grab it. You know, hammer, trepidation right hand. It's my dad. Again, my dad was not violent, but you just don't know. <laughs> Go. <laughs> kind of. I got Chucky as my neighbor, right? What do you expect? Go out to the driveway, and he says, I want you to take this hammer, and I want you to hit that top, and every time you hit it, you're going to declare who you are in Christ. You're going to speak out who you are. I'm like, what do you mean? Like this. You're strong. He smashes it. I'm, like, I'm strong, and I smash this top. I'm smart, and I smash this top. I'm loved by my parents. I smash this top. I'm having this moment where there's this equal joy and jubilation yet sadness at the same time where I'm declaring the truth of God over my life and I'm dancing around this broken spinning top with a hammer as I see a neighbor in the corner of my eye walk by. I can only imagine what he's thinking. That weird homeschool family doing it again in the driveway. What weird activity is this now? But as I'm there with these shattered pieces of the spinning top, that moment changed my life. Because it takes the voice of a father to break the authority of those lies. It takes the voice of the father to declare truth in the midst of darkness and see captives set free. And we are in a moment in our generation where the lies of the enemy have made a rampage over the souls of this generation. And we need fathers to stand up and speak truth. Yeah. Declare the identity of how they're designed in God's image and likeness. Now, we celebrate Mother's Day in the church, and it's a beautiful thing. But I feel Father's Day is one of those moments that is so delicate because we always remember the fathers we didn't have. And I think about the single moms that are raising their kids in the midst of a vacuum of fatherlessness. And today, I want you to know your Father in heaven will fill that gap. But I will challenge men to rise up in their spiritual identity as fathers in this house. This is not to diminish the genders or diminish moms. But dads, this is our moment to rise up and stand strong. Both those in the natural and the spiritual. We have an orphan generation that needs the voice of truth in their lives. And that happens in your school, happens in the marketplace. I feel for some of you here that are business owners, you are a dad to your employees. You don't even realize it. They're looking to you for leadership. They're looking you for you for wisdom. To those, I feel for some of you, your bosses have orphan spirits. And you're the father to your boss. They don't even know it. It's time to share this truth. And I believe we are on the precipice of a move of God and a revival. And the last thing we need is a bunch of spiritual orphans running around churches without dads. See, the last book of the Old Testament, the last prophecy given, is about God turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers. And I, I'm, I'm really kind of frustrated with a lot of translations and I, I understand it's done in the spirit to include all. But the translation says fathers, not parents. Some of your Bibles will read parents. And, and again, bless that. But we need dads in this moment. The voice of authority needs to be here. The priest of the house, the leader of the house, needs to be present in this moment. And see, we don't see the finality of this prophecy fulfilled with Jesus and John the Baptist, we see the beginning of it being filled. It's very important. There weren't these final prophecies done in these moments. This is the spirit of Elijah coming to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and children back to their fathers. And we see this revival take place, starting with John the Baptist and all these baptisms taking place. But then Jesus fulfills the modeling of what the heart of the father, of what Yahweh actually looks like. As he's walking around, he's bridging the gap where Yahweh was viewed to be this distant God, but now he's ever present in our time of need and he's caring and he's compassionate. 
And he began to say, you know, I'm the son of God. It means to carry, he carried his character and his likeness. But I love the questions the disciples ask. See, when we read the disciples, we can make fun of them. But honestly, we're the disciples in many ways. And I love how they would think about these questions. You can imagine it. They're getting ready. They're practicing. They're rehearsing these questions. And then the moment comes to ask Jesus, and they're so proud. And Philip says in John 14, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. You can imagine Philip asking Jesus and looking back and forth like, this is a good one, right? Jesus replies, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? The character, the love, the boldness, the generosity of the Father was exemplified in Jesus. And now the disciples that were aiming to look like Jesus are called to carry out the Father's love as he did. Now, it was easier to bridge that gap in the Jewish culture. However, the gospel was go beyond just the Jews to the Gentiles, right? So now we have Paul leading these churches, and he's fighting a culture that's completely other than theirs. And as he starts to plant churches, particularly in this place called Corinth, he starts to run into this issue with culture. Because at that time, the Greco-Roman culture would exalt philosophers and teachers and make them celebrities. And they would exalt these celebrities up and they would say, I follow Socrates or I follow Plato, right? Now they see this same trap being started in these churches. And as they're there, he plants this church in Corinth, and these rumblings of their favorite preachers start to come around. Sounds like America a little bit, right? America, that's right. So their favorite preachers, and they start saying, I listen to so-and-so, I listen to so-and-so. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, For one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos. But aren't they merely human? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you became? Believers in Christ. That's all it is. They're just men. Because we exalt these celebrities, these people to be idols in our life. But you know what it's birthed from? An orphan spirit. And when Paul's writing to the Corinthians, he says, listen, you have 10,000 guardians in your life, but you only have a few fathers. And I became your father in the gospel. See, Paul's coming to this very dysfunctional church to break this orphan spirit. He says, I have come as a father in your life in this very moment. And he uses language that would be familiar to them at the time. Now, these guardians, was a very, it was a common custom inside the Greek culture. And this is what it was. You would hire a slave or a servant to be a guardian to your child. And they would raise them up in education. It's actually a vegetative term, believe it or not. It was a farmer's term where they would raise up these kids like crops. But here's the key thing. The soul of the father, or soul of the child, was in the care of the father. So you would entrust the education to these guardians, but the moral, ethical life was in the responsibility of the father of that house. They were the ones that would train them in the way that they should go, how they should live. And what these two cultures would do is this, and Paul was very accustomed to these things. So the Greek culture developed this ideal as to what a perfect dad looked like. Socrates said this, The education of a father was to embody good resolve, brave actions, discipline, and wisdom. Pretty good. These are the aims of a good father. However, the Jews took it one step further. I love this. The wisest of these gives instructions in the fear of God and in kingship. The most righteous in uprightness, the most prudent in inner freedom and self-discipline, the most manly in fearlessness. This is the aim of a father, to raise their sons in fearlessness, so no matter what they face, they would overcome it in confidence that they have a father that loves them and is behind them. Even war, which catches up everything like a whirlpool, cannot take this away. This is the call of us as fathers, to raise up our sons and daughters in confidence that we have a good heavenly father that is behind us, that will strengthen us, but to raise them in the way they should go. I want us to focus as we just close here in a couple minutes. I'm going to interview my dad in just a second here. 
three values that we see modeled in the New Testament. Three values, we're going to call these patterns of powerful fathers. If we're going to raise up this generation, whether you have earthly kids or not, we need to walk in the spirit and power that we see in the first century, modeled through Paul and Jesus. Number number one value would be this. Powerful fathers live out faithfulness. They're called to be faithful. Faithfulness is this trustworthy resolve we have. Proverbs 20 says, there's many that declare their own goodness, their own strengths, their own gifts, but a faithful man is hard to find. See, this faithfulness is something we're called to live out. And one of the greatest examples of faithfulness that I think we overlook in the entire New Testament is Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. Joseph lives this out in a way that many of us would not. Think about this. He's pledged to this woman named Mary. And then as he's pledged, he's preparing the house in this betrothment. She gets pregnant. And she says it's by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right. (laughs) Think about this. She has this dream. She has this encounter. And then all of a sudden, her womb starts to grow. Her belly starts to grow. And she says, hey, Joseph, don't worry. It's God. Joseph's caught by surprise. He doesn't know what to do. And here's the nobleness of this man. Instead of publicly shaming her, he decides to divorce her quietly. As he takes this to the Lord and he says, I don't want to shame this woman. I don't want to ruin her family. But I, I, I don't trust what's taking place. He gets this encounter with this angel. As he meets him in a dream, the angel says, this is of the Holy Spirit. And he wakes up. And he hears the words of the angel. And endures public ridicule and shame. Think about this. He would have lost so many of his business relationships at the time. Because now he's the husband of a prostitute is how it would be viewed. One that broke the marriage covenant. As he lives this out, they give birth to Jesus. He's then trying to establish a house in Bethlehem for a short season. He then receives another dream. And in this dream, it says, you must run because Herod's going to take your family's life. And what does he do? He uproots everything to follow the word of the Lord and moves to Egypt for a season. This is a model of biblical faithfulness that's hard to ignore. This is our call as fathers to live things out even when others would give up. Joseph was a faithful man. Second thing is this. We as dads, a pattern of a powerful father is we're called to focus called the focus. All throughout the book of Proverbs, we find these instructions where it says, children, listen to your fathers. Heed their instruction. Heed their commands. Don't turn from them. Proverbs chapter 4. These are great, but here's what we have to understand. The difference between America and the Jewish culture is this. When we hear, hear instruction, we think of lectures, right? We think of an organized class. The Jewish way of teaching was modeling a life they could live after. I will teach you by showing you how to live. Very different. Your instruction is not a lecture. It's a life well lived. And the only way to carry this out, church, is if we have a focused and disciplined life. This doesn't happen accidentally. It has to be intentional. You can't accidentally raise your kids in the way they should go. It has to be intentional. And we see Paul take on all these churches as a spiritual father. And he plants this church in Thessalonica, referred to as the Thessalonians. And guess what happens? They start to think that Jesus is going to come back every day. And these men start quitting their jobs. Well, Jesus is going to come back. There's no need to work. There's no need to do these things. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he writes to them and says, I've heard a rumor that you are not following the pattern that we showed to you. And some of you are living in idleness, not as the pattern we showed. You're living out idleness. Some translations would be laziness. And I want you to know this. In the Greek culture, idleness and laziness are two separate things. See, laziness is easy to point out. We've all encountered those that live lazy lives. But idleness is tricky. 
See, the word idle here literally means this, to evade responsibility. It's the appearance of busyness while neglecting that which you're called to tend to. Did you capture that? It's looking busy while evading your responsibility. We as men, as fathers, I want to encourage you. Now, wives, this is the last thing we want to do is you'd be poking your husband. See, I told you. No, that will not work well. Now's not the moment to ignite stubborn strength. That's not what we want. When we encourage focus, I want you to think about this. Okay, Holy Spirit, what responsibilities have I been evading? Have I been e avoiding over time? Okay, and you take these, and what will often happen is one will be burdening you that you feel the enemy almost saying, you should be doing, you should be doing. It's not you should. You got to feel the invitation of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes, he'll tell you to pay attention to something that you don't think makes a big difference, and it always does. Is it your finances? Is it your family? Is it responsibility at work? What is it? Is it your health? It's time to refocus, and what you'll notice is it starts to change and raise the water level in your life. What's that intentional thing that you've been neglecting? Let me tell you, dads, we're in a distracted age where it's really easy to neglect that which matters most. Right now, if your kid's 11, 12, you don't have that many more summers left. This is it. My dad was great when I was 18, 19, 20, but what mattered most was 11, 12, 13. Don't wait for another day to begin investing intentionally in your family in those relationships. You don't have it that you can risk. This is it. This is your shot. Take these years. And you say, well, that's overwhelming. And what we tend to do is we say, well, every day I'm going to. Let me challenge you this. Try to make one intentional connection with your child a week. That's it. One meaningful connection a week. You say, that doesn't sound like very much. Then good. Give it a shot. Try it out. That's 52 intentional connections in a year. Meaningful impacts over 10 years. 520 intentional impacts. I guarantee when they're there older, one day encountering challenges, they'll remember that moment they connected with their father. Those moments matter. Last pattern of powerful fathers is forgiveness. The greatest illustration we have of this forgiveness is Luke 15, the prodigal son. We love this story. It's when we share, when we preach. It's a beautiful illustration. We've all heard it, but it's a parable. It's an example of God as Father forgiving us, right? But when do we actually see this lived out? It's in this small little book called Philemon. How many of you have actually ever read Philemon? Raise your hand. You've read through it just because it's part of your Bible plan, right? And you're like, why is this letter actually in the New Testament? Philemon deserves its own message one day, but I'll reference it quickly. Philemon was a house church leader most likely a wealthy businessman. And as he's leading this house church, one of his servants, better way to say employees, steals from him. And it's quite a sizable sum. We don't know what happened, but he burned a bridge bad. And it just so happens that Paul's in prison, and guess who he meets? This servant of Philemon, named Onesimus. And we don't know if Onesimus was in prison because he had stole something or if he's serving someone else. Paul leads him to Jesus. Beautiful story. He then writes a letter and has Onesimus deliver it back in which Paul calls Onesimus his son. That's the heart of adoption, church. And in beautiful language, he writes to Philemon and says, hey, listen, Receive him as you would receive my heart. And if he owes you anything, ascribe it to my account. But remember, you owe me too. <laughs> it's the best. Read it. Read it for yourself. And they live out the prodigal son in real life. 
This letter is so famous that there's multiple letters written at this time that would be the opposite spirit of this in the Greco-Roman culture. This would have been an absurd letter to be read at that time. And that's why it's in our New Testament, because it shows the character and heart of God as a forgiving father and a practical way to live it out. As we close today, I'm going to invite up one of my heroes, a man that's changed my life in ways that I don't have adequate words to share. Would you welcome my dad, Charlie Naramore, as he shares today. Get it for Charlie. So I was telling Sam earlier, I thought this, this leg might collapse on me. So if it does, just make sure you laugh really hard. Just make sure you laugh. Hey, you got my back, Brian. All right. Dad. Son. Oh, let's get this mic on for you. There we go. Check, check. We're good. Dad. <laughs> there we go. Huge honor to have you here. I've known you for 39 incredible years. I feel like I've known you your whole life. Well, you have known me your whole life. Uh, but again, it's a huge honor to have you here. And uh, normally if I were to interview somebody, um, Sean, could you move this for me by chance over there so that the people don't see it? Uh, normally, I would be asking all the questions, but because you're my dad, you have free reign, and you said, I have to ask you a question when we open up. So I'm going to give my dad the floor in <laughs> this moment. So dad, do you have a question for me? I love my dad so much. <laughs> Only my dad. He said, yeah, I have, a, I have a question for you you have to answer. What does that even mean? How do I eat my pancakes? Describe to me, how do you eat your pancakes? I mean, you make them, you bake them. How do you eat them? Tell me about that. Um, take butter, put them on the pancake, stack them up big, cut them in squares, and I'm a dipper. I'm not one of those smotherers. Any dippers out there? Dip that syrup. That's how I eat my pancakes. Exactly what I thought. Let me tell you a little story. <laughs> Brandon was probably six, seven years old, and it's pancake breakfast, and Pops is cooking pancakes. So I make the pancakes, I get them served up on the plate, and I walk over to his plate, and I butter them on top. I cut them into pieces, because he wasn't so good at cutting and keeping them on the plate. <laughs> so I cut them into pieces, put the syrup on top, and I said, here you go, Brand. And he looks at me and says, you know, Dad, when I grow up, I'm gonna eat my pancakes just like you. <laughs> and I said, well, you've got your pancakes here. What do you mean, just like me? He says, Dad, I want a big stack with the butter on top and the syrup running all over it, and then I eat my pancakes dipped in the pile. Dip, you know, the pile of syrup. And I said, wow. And that really took me back because our kids are watching us at things we would never imagine them watching and they're learning and mimicking us to see what we do. So to this day, <clears throat> I still am careful how I serve my pancakes. <laughs> I love that so but much. I from that, that Brandon is watching everything I do, and I've got to make sure that I example and model to him healthy and good things, because if I don't, he'll be learning the wrong things. Back to you, son. I love that. Thank you for the question. Um, again, you grew up in a household that really was maybe Easter once a year they go to church. There, it was not a Christian house. Again, I met your parents uh, when I was young. How did you come to know Jesus? Well, there was, I got saved in 1975. Kind of the Jesus movement had happened in like 70, 69, 70. And so I was at the back end of that. And a lot of my friends had gotten saved. I was real successful in sports and it just didn't fill me on the inside. And so at that point I said, God, if you can fill this gap, you know, I've done everything that the world can give me at this point. If you can fill this gap, and he showed me different ways that that would happen. I'd say, I'm committing myself to you. And at that point, I made a decision for the Lord when I was 18. So I love that. And then again, from that time, you dealt with a lot of disappointment. I mean, you had 
great aspirations, even Olympic aspirations with shot put and hammer, all the above. Um, how did you deal with those disappointments in your life? Sports disappointments? Yeah, just definitely where you thought your career would go. I did aspire to compete in the Olympics and had done very well. I was nationally ranked, um, but I just didn't get there. Injuries had kind of crept in and, and that, was, uh, that was tough. But I'd gotten saved now and my coach had called me in and he said, you just seem distracted on the field or distracted while you're training. He said, what's going on? Have you got a girlfriend? What's, what's distracting you? And I said, well, I met Jesus. And he looks at the other coach and he said, well, we've heard that before. <laughs> I love that. And at that point, my priorities in my life had changed from competing and striving, you know, or to, to be an Olympic athlete, to growing as what the Lord would have for me. I love that. Uh, and again, you modeled that. And so I think for me, you, you really were a first generation believer and you established our household in God. How, how did you approach that? How did you learn to do that when you really weren't given that example before? Well, you know, I met this sweet little gal along the way named Debbie. <laughs> and so Debbie and I both committed, you know, that we wanted to be strong and interacting parents and connecting. And so we read every book we could find because neither one of us had come from a home that modeled that. And so I just had the father's heart that was placed in me. And I would just be thinking, you know, what, what, what can I do to be a good father, a good dad? And he would just give me words, you know, what to do. And it was like, he would ask me, he said, what would you have wanted in a father? Well, those are the things that I would note and say, this is what I wanted. A dad who would be with me when I was going places, show up, come to my sports events, um, inspire me, you know, hear my heart. Um, be a part of my life, be a part of my journey. And you know, it's just interesting because as we raise our children, there's a scripture that says, train up a child and when he is young and when he is old, he will not depart from it in Proverbs. And it says in there, I believe the actual Greek or Hebrew says, instead of raising him up in the way he should go, it's raise him in his bent. And a bent would be kind of like a tree branch. They never grow straight. They always have crooks and curves in them. And these are where the pressures of nature have moved on that tree branch and caused it to bend to what nature would have for it. So you need to understand what is the bent of my child? What is his nature? And an example for Brandon would be, as a little boy, Brandon loved to have fun and loved to play. So at that point it was, how can I implement that into our relationship? Time to clean the rooms. Let's go clean our room, son. I don't want to do that. Uh, you know, I want to go outside and play. Tell you what, Brandon, let's have a race. You clean your room. I'm going to clean my room. Are you ready? His eyes light up. Bam! Down the hall he goes. Here's the door slam. And he's in his room cleaning like a maniac. So I go in my room. I close the door loud so that he knows that I'm in there. My room's already clean. So I... <laughs> so true. My dad's nails. He's so, so organized. <laughs> So I pull some clothes out of the closet and put them on the floor, take some dirty clothes and put them around, pull a couple of magazines out and set them on the bed. Sat in red. Five or ten minutes later, I hear a pitter patter down the feet and a knock on the door. Ch -ch -ch -ch. And I said, he and I hear, Dad, Dad. I said, are you okay? Yeah, I won. I won. I said, what do you mean you won? My room is clean and you're not done yet. So I open up the door and he comes busted in. He says, see, your room's not done. Mine's done. I won. I won. And we go back and his room was cleaned immaculately for a seven-year-old. And so he enjoyed it. It was a race. He won. And at that point, he had no clue that I was feeding his bent to help nurture him into where he goes. I know, right? It's masterful. It's a master class. So one of the big elements was you try to cultivate a healthy relationship between Preston and I that were very different. Uh, my brother would be here. He's on a trip right now. Uh, but with that being said, how did you cultivate a healthy relationship between your kids? Something that I had learned um, years ago was if you could raise your children to be friends, then why would they fight with each other? So Deb and I adopted that into how we raised our boys. Make them friends. Make them like each other. And so as they would be disciplined for something that 
they were fighting over or whatever, Deb had developed, I'm going to send them to the room and they can't talk to each other. So they would be in a room by themselves, but they couldn't communicate. So they'd be sliding little notes underneath the doors trying to talk back and forth. So at that point, their friendship had started to be developed. Is that when we're away from each other, it's not a happy time. But when we're together, we fight. How can we work this out? So we started to, um, at that point, work on forgiveness in their lives. Because as they would offend each other, that's where offenses would creep in and cause them to not be unified. And when you're offended with someone, how are you friends with that person? It's tough because there's a fence. And so one of the things that we would do is we would have family meetings. Well, at the family meetings, it was open table. Anyone could address anything. So with Brandon and Preston, there was a conflict that had origin, arisen with them. And I thought, we're going to address this because we talked to them over and over and over, and we couldn't get it resolved, so we addressed it at the family meeting. So the offense was Preston was being left out by Brandon at church. No matter what Brandon would go and do, he wouldn't want Preston to tag along. I don't want my little brother here because he's impressing his friends and being cool. And who wants their little brother along for that? So poor little Preston just was crushed by this because they had always been raised to be friends, watch out for each other, protect each other, and esteem each other. Well, when this occurred, Preston was just devastated. So we addressed that at the family meeting. So I explained to Brandon, I said, you know, at church, you have all your friends that you hang out with and you play with and you run with and do all your things. He says, yeah, Dad, it's great. And I says, is Preston a part of that? And he says, no, he's just my little brother and he keeps trying to tag along with me. And I said, well, take a look at that little face over there that's looking at you. He would love to be your friend all the time, not just when you choose it. And Preston's sitting there just all sad. And I said, <clears throat> look at that face, Brandon. Is that a happy face or is that a sad face? And he said, well, he looks pretty sad. <laughs> Preston, Preston breaks out into tears. Brandon sees this. My good friend Preston, Brandon breaks out in tears and realizes I'd broken his heart. I've crushed him. So we talked about forgiveness and how do we heal this. And forgiveness, can I take one more second here? Yeah. Forgiveness is kind of like a ping pong game. Someone has the ball, someone wants to return the ball. So as you begin this valley, this volley, someone has to serve the ball to the competitor. Well, once that ball is served, just in for, as in forgiveness, I serve to you, will you forgive me for the trespass that has occurred? The person on the other side now gets to volley that ball back. They have a choice. I'm going to volley the ball back and say, yes, I forgive you, and we're going to restore our relationship. Or I choose not to volley the ball back, and I'm going to instead harbor anger towards you, which will result in bitterness, and our relationship will be broken. So with Brandon and Preston, we had taught them, you ask forgiveness, and then that person now has the choice to either accept it and mend the relationship or not and allow there to be a crack in that relationship. So with the two boys at that table that day, and they, you probably remember this event occurring, both boys do, is that there was a healing that took place in how to mend that relationship and restore their friendship and Preston and him have been on the same team since that day on. Love that. It's true. A couple questions here as we uh, hopefully wrap up soon here, but unfortunately I have to wrap up. Uh, that being said, you really instilled in us a love for learning. And uh, that was a, a unique gift you gave us that we didn't even know was happening at the time. We'd sit down for lunch together on his day off and read Richest Man in Babylon in old English <laughs> at the time. We, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad came out. That was a big thing. Even the Arnold Schwarzenegger Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. Yes. He taught us that one yes. as we'd lift weights together all throughout junior high and high school. Uh, talk about that love of learning and cultivating healthy relationship uh, around those things. You know, I have always learned by watching and doing. And so I thought with my kids, it's the same way. If I don't teach them by doing and having them watch me, 
then how are they going to catch what I'm trying to teach them? So ever since the boys were little, I'd always take them on things that I was doing. So if I had to go to the bank, make a deposit, meet with a loan officer, go to a seminar, hear motivational speakers, all these different events that I would go to, I always took my boys with me. And it was never, you have to go, you get to go. And so they got that, that I get to go with dad to do these things. Even if it was going just to get a loaf of bread at the store, we were going to serve the family and we we're going to help each other. I remember one time, this is a, when Brandon was a little tiny boy, we were shopping at the store and they were, we were heading up to the checkout and there was this family in front of us and this little kid just starts, he blows a fuse and he's screaming and he's crying because he wanted that piece of candy or whatever it was at the checkout stand and mom was saying no and this guy just was unloading. He was just getting crazy. So Brandon was probably, I don't know, four or five at the time. So I leaned over and said, Brandon, do you see that kid over there? And he says, yeah, the one crying real loud. And I said, yeah. I said, what do you think's going on there? And he said, well, he wanted to get candy and the mom told him no. And I said, well, what do you think should happen? He needs his bun spanked, you know? <laughs> so at that point, I thought, Brandon's catching it. He's seeing bad actions and the results of not being treated or loved out of those bad actions. But he could understand that concept. And so it was training starts at day one. But if you don't take them and be a part of your life, like I said, then how are they going to learn and watch? Them? And one thing I just want to make a comment to uh, is my, my father would take us along in journeys that he didn't have the answer to. I think, I think a misconception we often have is I got to teach my kids things I know. Take them on the experience and journey of learning. I mean, I don't know yeah. if you want to speak totally. to that at all. Totally. Um, have you ever met Robert Kiyosaki? I have. And who is he? Rich dad, poor dad, man. Yep. Yeah. So we would go on these adventures to learn things. And it was always great because we would not only be a part of what was happening there, but had another opportunity with people that we met would be able to minister to them. I remember one time we were down at an event and we had met with the fella at a, at a, on a private meeting that we had hired him for. When we were done, I said, can I pray for you? And he looks at me and he steps back and he looks at Brandon and Brandon looks at me and the guy says, oh, yeah, I guess. So I said, okay. I walk up, I lay my hand on him and start praying for him with all these great things. And Brandon, as we left the meeting, he said, dad, you prayed for that guy. And I said, yeah, we'll have to see what God does. Well, God opened the door. There was an incredible relationship. And I remember probably five or ten years after that, I had crossed paths with the fellow. And I said, you remember when we first met? And, I, and he said, yeah, I'll never forget that day. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you prayed for me in my office. He said, I had gone to church. And I had seen things, you know, where people get prayed for. They talk about stuff. But no one had ever done it to me. He said, I will never forget that day opportunities everywhere we go. That was modeled by my father. So again, you as parents have the power to model these things. One last question here. Uh, we live in an age of digital addiction. You know, it's a very different parenting age. Again, we were the advent of the internet <laughs> back when I was there. But, but there's something I really want us to take away. You know, again, when I was 10, internet comes out, I stumble into pornography on the internet. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, something that had so much shame how would you encourage parents now where their kids are having phones and massive addiction issues, how would you encourage them to help their kids in the midst of these troubles? I think one of the key elements is you've got to have a relationship with your kid or they're not going to allow you access. And you had mentioned it just a few minutes ago. Set an intentional time once a week just to be intentional and build a bridge to your child. And if you're not doing that, that bridge will never be built and there won't be access. And another thing that's important is sometimes there's just not access to the child. And how do I gain that access? Deb and I would have the same encounter with our kids, you know, strong-willed children, and how do you develop and break through the barrier, break through that wall? And the way you do it is you sit there until it's done. You don't give up. And if you don't finish it today, because it's a late night or it's just too late, then you either press through and complete it and just push through the wall or say, we're addressing this tomorrow when you get back from school. 
4 o'clock, we're meeting. And you continue with the same conversation and pick it up where you left off. I think one thing, too, I'm, I noticed with my parents, again, worship team can come up, is they led with love where there was areas of shame. It's really important. If you meet shame with shame, there's no breakthrough or healing. They met with love and forgiveness in the midst of those moments and helped walk through it. And again, modeling vulnerability. I think the biggest thing is I walk away with my parents, again, they're first generation believers. They didn't have all the answers and they didn't live like they did. It's really important. They invited us in the journey and me, you know, a single dad, working through things with my parents, having my parents available to me. You may not have access to that. Inside of this church is a wealth of wisdom of spiritual mothers and fathers. Amen. There's so many incredible leaders here. Go to those, and I call you out, with gray hair, unless it's slightly colored. They have wisdom we need, and this is how we're going to see revival in our midst and families healed. Uh, Dad, final thoughts. You know, I think, uh, and I've always tried to live this from when I learned it, is that your lives are the only Bible that some people will ever read. And that goes for our children, that goes for our spouses, that goes for our work environment. Wherever we are, our lives are the only Bible that some people will ever read. And I want them to read the right word when they Come see on. my life. I love that. Let's stand together. Beautiful time. Father, we just thank you again for Father's Day. A beautiful moment where I can stand with my dad and celebrate. You good? I'm going to have you pray here. Life and journey. I'll, I'll give you my mic. You're good. The life and journey that he's been on as my father. And Lord, we just pray right now that you would empower the mothers and fathers in this house, those watching online, strengthen the dads in this moment. Dad, just pray a prayer of blessing over them. In the name of Jesus, I just release your abundance and your grace upon these families, upon these husbands, upon these wives, upon these children. Let your abundance allow your grace. Infiltrate us, Lord. Let us just soak. Let us just marinate. Let us just know your presence. Let us walk in your abundance. I just release you all to just know God as your father. And when you address him, it's not as God, but when you make that transition into my father, my God, that you own that relationship, your life will walk in a deeper place. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.